Welcome to this video on types of chemical bonds. So one of the really important things when we get to bonding is actually the periodic trend in electronegativity values. And so electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. Um, I think of this more as just their ability to attract more electrons to themselves, but this is actually the, the textbook definition. So if we take a look at this trend, we will see that we have the highest value right up over here in this 4.0, and this is actually fluorine. Okay, and then our lowest values are over in the other corner. So this one right here, and actually there's a couple of them down in that corner, is going to be francium, and so cesium's just above there. Okay. So our overall trend then is that we're going to increase from bottom to top in a group and then from left to right across a period. Now you'll notice that over here on the side we have the noble gases crossed out. Um, we also don't need to worry about the man-made ones down here below, but basically the understanding is that these noble gases virtually have no um, or very little electronegativity. So the noble gases um, have no or very little e EN for electronegative. Um, there are some that actually will go through some covalent bonding um, that we will see later on, <clears throat> but kind of the understanding is it's a very small amount, and that makes sense because they always already have a full valence shell, and so they're not going to need to attract more electrons necessarily to themselves. So why do elements bond? Um, elements bond to become more stable. And in the process of that, they're trying to lower their overall energetics. Um, and when they do that, their electron configuration um, becomes that of a noble gas. And so that's kind of the idea behind this. And so they're going to um, do something with their valence electrons in order to look more like the noble gases, okay? So we're going to do something with these valence electrons to look more like a noble gas. And so the things that we tend to see them do are to either gain, lose, or somehow share valence electrons um, to get to that noble gas electron configuration. All right, so let's take a look just at types of chemical bonds. Um, we're going to talk about metallic first. We're going to come back and do a little more with metallic later just to make sure we have a kind of broad understanding of this. But metallic bonds are going to be those where we have metal cations that are surrounded by what we call a sea of electrons, or um, another way of stating that are delocalized, so sea of electrons. <laughs> um, or delocalized electrons. And so these electrons are not on any specific cation, they're just kind of floating around all of the metal cations. Um, ionic, we have an electrostatic attraction between the positive cation and a negative anion. So the ions have to form first, and then because of the differential charge, um, they're going to go ahead and go through that bonding. So the positive and the negative is where we're getting that electrostatic attraction. And then we have our covalent bonds. Um, elements are going to share time with va valence electrons. And we know um, that nonpolar, we have equal sharing. And with polar, we have unequal sharing of those electrons. And so that's something that we're going to take a far more in-depth look at all the way around um, are each one of these as we go through the next 
few topics. Okay, so the first thing we want to take a look at is just determining polarity based on some electronegativity differences. And so we have these ranges, <laughs> and then it gives us kind of a bond type. Um, this doesn't work out perfectly, but this is one way that we can evaluate based on some, num some numerical values. So I'm going to grab my calculator here. Oops. All right, so we want to determine the polarity of these bonds below. We're just looking at just a bond between two different elements. So what we have to do is go back and look at that chart that I showed you at the beginning with those values. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that just based on my chart. Um, and so I know that hydrogen has a value of 2.1. So I'm going to have my electronegativity values here. So hydrogen... Um, so these are EN values. Hydrogen is going to be 2.1. Um, fluorine is 4.0. Carbon is going to be... Two point five, I believe. Yep, two point five. And then nitrogen is going to be three. Oops. Three point zero. Okay. And so we want to find the difference. So for the first one, we're going to take our four point zero for fluorine. Okay, so we take the bigger number minus our 2.1, okay, and we get an electronegativity difference, okay, so we're looking for our EN difference, okay, so 4.0, I should probably do that in my head, minus 2.1, but let's just check here, and we get a difference of 1.9. All right, so when we look at this, we find, um, that 1.9 is going to fall into this category right here. So this would be polar covalent. Okay, so this is going to be polar. And we also want to go ahead and show the direction of greater negativity. So we do that with a little vector. Okay, so the the more, the higher the electronegativity value, um, the more negative or the more time those electrons are going to spend with that. And so we're going to point that in the direction of fluorine because that had the higher value. And then hydrogen, we kind of have this little plus end. The other way that we denote this is we can say that the hydrogen end is slightly positive. We have that little Greek symbol sigma um, and then a positive sign, and then the fluorine is slightly negative. So those are all different ways that we can take a look at these bonds. Um, so then we get to hydrogen and carbon. And so we're going to have our 2.5 minus our 2.1. That gives us 0 0.4. And so the interesting thing about 0 0.4 is we see that that's kind of where we overlap. In this particular case, we, t we consider um, that to be nonpolar covalent. So this one is considered to be nonpolar covalent um, between the hydrogen and the carbon. If it's nonpolar, we're saying they're pretty much sharing equally, and so we don't need to write the vector quantity or any sigmas. Um, partial charges on either end because we consider them to be sharing those equally. And then finally, we have the one between hydrogen and or hydrogen and nitrogen. So we're going to have our um, 3.0 minus our 2.1. And that's going to give us our 0 0.9. Okay, so 0 0.9, and that again is going to be 
polar covalent. And in this case, it's also going to be pointing to the right only because that higher electronegativity value is on the nitrogen. So when we draw that little vector quantity, we're going to go this direction. Now, if we were to compare those, if we were to really draw vectors like you do in physics, then of course the 1.9 is greater than the 0.9. And um, so that would be a little bit larger of a vector. We don't usually worry too much about that. So this is still the positive end and the negative end. Okay. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes we'll find things that have nonmetals that'll actually show as ionic, <laughs> which isn't the case. So this um, is kind of a good way to look at electronegativity difference, but it's not the only factor in determining um, this covalent um, versus ionic type of a situation. But we can look at the relative polarity of these bonds. So the other thing that we can do is we can look at increasing ionic character. So we just said that this one, the EN difference. So for each one of these, this one was 1.9. This was 0 0.4. And the last one was 0 0.9. And so if we want to determine the order of increasing ionic character, then what we would do is we would go, okay, well, the um, lowest, okay, <laughs> the lowest or number one would be our nonpolar covalent. And then even though both of these are polar covalent, the HF and the HN, um, the second one would actually be... Um, okay. In, in between because of the value that we see. And then the highest is going to be hydrogen and fluorine. So we're looking at increasing. So you have to really look at the terminology on that sometimes to make sure that we're getting that in the right direction. All right. So that is kind of the, the overall, but how do we actually determine the type of bond um, that we have? we really must consider both the electronegativity and other properties of that particular compound or molecule that we're taking a look at. And so for ionic bonds, if you have a metal cation, okay, so this is really the big deal with, with ionic, okay, we have a metal cation and we have a non-metal anion. Now, the exception to that is if we see any kind of polyatomic ion, Okay, so you have to be careful because we have something like NH4, SO4. This NH4 and the SO4 are both polyatomic ions, and so um, there are no metals in this. So a lot of times we'll say it's a metal and a nonmetal, but there are no metals in this. It's still going to be ionic. Um, the functional definition for an ionic bond is it's any compound that conducts an electric current when melted. And so that's kind of interesting. Um, and this is where we kind of find those lines. So this is looking more at what a property would be. Okay, so this functional definition is really looking at a property. So I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at that. We don't tend to melt those down and test them <laughs> um, because they would be very molten and very hot. And then the other part of this is covalent bonds. Um, overall are going to be non-metals that are bonded together, okay? And that exclusion factor comes back to these polyatomic ion examples that we see sometimes, okay? So those are something to keep in mind as you're trying to classify and look at what type of a substance you have um, and what type of a bond and how we would look at those bond energies and different things like that, geometries, as we continue to move forward. I hope that was helpful.